Hello, uh, welcome back to the ShareBrain channel. I'm Jared. Today I'm going to hack on a replacement component for a 90 year old telephone switch. Um, we're talking about the types of switches that routed phone calls between various subscribers on the phone system uh, here in the United States, if starting in the 1930s. Uh, this particular switch is called the number one crossbar because it's developed around uh, a series of crossbar switches all driven by relays uh, or electromagnets. And yeah, the electromagnets move a bunch of stuff inside the switch and cause different relay contacts to open and close, effectively routing uh, electrical signals from people's phones from point A to point B. So um, let me show you first what the, one of these switches looks like. Um, you can actually see them in person operating at a place called the Connections Museum in Seattle, Washington in the United States. I happen to live fairly close and I've been a bunch, well, a bunch of times. I've been twice. Uh, both times it's been amazing. If you ever find yourself near the Seattle area on a Sunday, you can go and visit and you can stand amongst these machines and enjoy um, being told how they work by people who operate and repair them. Uh, so let's switch over to the computer. Um, and here is a bit of video from the Connections Museum of the number one crossbar that they have in operation. And it makes all sorts of beautiful noises. <laughs> Except when my HDMI configuration or audio configuration is messed up. Um, I had this problem before. Pulse audio volume control. And if I do switch away and then I switch back. Uh, I remember it magically fixing itself. Or not. That sounds awful. Okay. Well, um, let me turn the volume on that down a little bit so you don't have to listen to it, but I think if I flip it once or twice more it'll work better. Good pause. That's a good sign. Yes. There, that's how it's supposed to sound. It doesn't sound all that much different, does it? So let's fast forward a little bit. And I don't remember if this video has a view of the relay portion. This is all like the control portions of the switch. Uh, so there's lots of indicators that show you what the switch is doing because basically it is a computer it's just built out of relays instead of out of semiconductors or i think there may be some vacuum tubes in this particular design uh, i'm not an expert uh definitely go to um the museum of communications the, the connections museum uh website and they also have a great youtube channel and you can learn the correct details about it, all of the inner workings of this um let me see if i can find Oops, buffering. Now this video is actually not all that good for showing relays. Well, that's fine because we have Sarah here who is a volunteer at the Connections Museum showing the relay portion of the system. So um, if you see here, there's these vertical rows or vertical columns, and those connect with uh, a set of relay points that are located in each of these little squares. Um, and these bars control which of the sets of relays along this vertical actually get closed. And that's how phone calls are connected. Um, so I was watching this video, which came out, I don't know, maybe three weeks ago or so, four weeks ago. And Sarah was lamenting how they can't get... Um, yeah, okay, so here's a close-up of the relay. Yeah, I should. this is actually a great shot. Um, this is a, one of those verticals which um, rocks left or right and controls a pin that moves either up or down or stays in the middle of these two little pieces of... They're kind of plastic. They're phenolic. And then... Oh, wait. I'm getting this mixed up. Uh, that's a different piece. Okay, so this vertical piece, all it does is it just sort of wiggles left and right. And depending upon whether there is a little metal spring positioned here, here, or here, it either causes 
this plastic piece to get pushed to the left or this plastic piece to get pushed to the left to the left closing uh, either these this set of switch uh, contacts or this set of switch contacts so you've basically got two separate connections here served by um, this this grouping um, let me see if I can find a good shot with one of the horizontal pieces ah you you can see it in the thumbnail and then I managed to Ah, yes. Okay, so what we were seeing just a minute ago was a close-up of one of these sections. There's also um, horizontal pieces that are on a pivot, and there are two electromagnets, one that will pull it kind of to pivoting up at an angle, and one electromagnet that pulls it down at an angle. And out of each of these, there is a little springy piece of it's it's this kind of thick wiry like spring steel and these electromagnets cause a whole this whole set of spring wire bits to move up or move down or stay in a neutral position um and there's i guess 10 of them going this way and then there's 10 of the verticals that i described earlier going vertically and depending upon the combination of which of those metal springs are either pushed up or pushed down when these verticals push towards the contacts, that determines which set of relay contacts across the entire switch are actually closed. Um, and that's, that's how it effectively produces switching. Um, I think there is a great video by uh, who's a, uh, Hicken65 just about the crossbar switch. And around 29 minutes, uh, the narrator goes into how all of this stuff works in much more detail. And you can see one of those spring metal bits here. Um, in fact, let me just zoom in a little bit and maybe we can move back and forth. Yeah, so I, I'm not entirely sure what like copyright and, and how all this stuff works when you're basically <laughs> repurposing somebody else's YouTube content. So I guess I feel a little bit weird showing this stuff, but I see it done all the time, so it must be fine, right? Yeah, so here's uh, a little bit of metal that um, that is on one of those horizontal pieces that can either flip up or flip down, and it causes this piece of this, um, this bit of wire, it's a very stiff wire, to either come up into this slot, stay in a neutral position, or come down into this slot, and then when this vertical is actuated and pushes against that whole set of stuff, um, it either pushes if, if a wire is here, it winds up pushing this whole apparatus to the left. If the metal is down here, it pushes this apparatus to the left. Uh, and if it's neutral, it doesn't push either of them. They, they stay open. So that's effectively, you know, depending upon where the, that metal bit is, up or down, when the vertical mechanism is actuated, you either get no relay contacts closed, or you get the top set closed, or you get the bottom set closed. So that's, that's it in a nutshell. Um, depending upon what function the particular set of switches are inside of the larger system. Um, you can have individual subscri subscribers phones connected to each of the verticals, and then the horizontals are connected out to the rest of the phone system that will route you to another subscriber in the local area or send you out through a trunk to um, a phone system far, you know, far away from your local office. Um, so that's kind of an overview of how all this stuff works. Um, now, Sarah, in, her, in the video that she posted, laments how, it's no surprise, uh, a 90-year-old telephone switch doesn't have replacement parts available. Uh, and she, in, in this video, dimes. So it is going to have to get fixed. Yeah, she discovers that one of these cards that get pushed to the left and move all the contacts broke. In the middle here, down here somewhere and so when the mechanism pushes against it some of the relays don't actuate and so she's hoping um she was wondering if there was a way to find replacements and how to build them um, and i volunteered to try and do that so uh, she sent me one and you can see it right there um, it's pretty small you can see my thumb in proportion to it it's quite large uh, I think it's it's about 30 millimeters across and about 7 millimeters uh, in height in that image. So I spent a bunch of time with my 
my mic measuring out all the little bits you know do 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 trying to get a whole bunch of measurements and eventually got to the point where i have this um i'm using keycad which is normally used to design printed circuit boards right um yeah there it is sorry so it's used to design printed circuit boards and this thing this little card that goes in the switch was originally made in a phenolic material which is kind of like printed circuit board material except back then they probably used uh, what's called die cutting where they make essentially a, a cookie cutter except because you're cutting really hard sort of plasticky phenolic the edges of the cookie cutter are razor sharp and they basically stamp down and you you cut the pieces that way well there are people that still do that but there's probably a lot of setup costs in contacting some somebody who still does that, getting the die set up because you know they have to go and create. Um, it's kind of like, you know, like um, doing injection molding or something like that. You need tooling in order to make the thing, and usually it's the expense of the tooling that um, is prohibitively expensive. Once you get started, once you've got the tooling, making each successive piece by just using the tool becomes very cheap. But uh, this is a museum we're talking about. They're maintaining equipment that has no commercial value. They don't have a lot of income. They, you know, they're running on volunteers and ideally we would find a very cheap way to do this. And I thought, well, since this is basically a printed circuit board without copper on it, why don't we try a printed circuit board technique? So, um, yeah, you're looking at the board now. The because of the the size of the um, the piece, uh, the way circuit boards are often made, they're milled with a, a tool that has a diameter to it, and so you can't get really tight corners like this. And in a piece like this, the tight corners are somewhat important because you've got say, um, let me zoom back out again. You've got each of those contacts are being pushed by. The left edge of these tabs and i don't know exactly how wide they are but they're going to seat in the corner and if the corner is too big and round it's going to wind up displacing the contacts further to the left potentially pushing them into contact with the other side even when they're not supposed to be touching it when they're supposed to be open and the circuits open so um, I've been shopping around for, with a couple of printed circuit board vendors trying to figure out what their minimum routing diameter is. And for example, um, JLC PCB, which I'm sure a lot of you know, all three of you. <laughs> hey Russ and uh, Derek Boom. I, I don't think I've seen you in chat before. Hello. Um, some of you may be familiar that uh, with PC, or JLC PCB, they apparently have a smaller uh, minimum diameter than PCB Way, which was the other company I was looking at, at using. Uh, so I'm doing two iterations, one where I'm taking the perfect outline, the, the ideal outline, um, which I didn't show you all the measurements. Yes, these are all the measurements I took. <laughs> um, so I've got this ideal outline, and then I am using the line tool to produce uh, shapes where I want their cutting tool with the diameter they specify as being their minimum to trace the path around the piece to get something close to what we need. So um, that's what I, I've been doing. I um, It was hours worth of work and uh, wasn't going to live stream all that because it's pretty tedious. I know, Peter, you might have a, a different opinion of what's fun to watch, but I guess I'm just too modest about showing people all the gory bits. Uh, in any case, um, I'm, I can show you what it looks like. You know, what I do is I basically take a segment I've already drawn and then just move it over so that it's nice and tucked in. Uh, except, okay, so there's a funny bug with KiCad where when you copy a, an object, sometimes it changes its alignment subtly and it's no longer on grid. If only Crafty John were here, I would complain. I guess it's what streaming's for, but uh, I don't know. This isn't as, as fun as watching somebody do a speed run with uh, an NES. But what do I know? I'm the one doing it, not the one watching it. So I guess I should let the people watching it decide whether they want to watch it or not, right? 
yeah, I th sometimes I just think too much. A lot of times I think too much. <laughs> okay, so yeah, I just kind of go around grabbing existing bits because it's easier than drawing them because um, I'm just not even bothering to change KiCad's default width, which I think is the other way I can get the correct width when I when I draw a new line. But instead I just copy it because it's easy. And drop it into place. And then this guy's going to be exactly the same size. Oh, and that time it aligned. Nice. Okay. Yeah, so I just go around like that. And then for PCB way, because apparently their routing is 0.8 millimeters uh, diameter. Um, I didn't actually select the other layer. Okay, turn off GLC PCB, select PCB way, line tool, draw a line. Yeah, see, right now I have the line tool set to default to, I don't know, whatever the default is. And it needs to be 0.8, which is quite wider, quite a bit wider than GLC PCB. Any bets on whether GLP, GLC PCB will actually cut at the minimum that they say they will, or if they'll just kind of do something random? Link. Oh, that's not quite lined up. Not that it'll matter in practice, but I am super OCD about these things. I should, I should really be dragging the end. That's better. Okay, and drag the end down like this. Once you get a few laid down, they're a whole lot easier to duplicate because the part, the shape around the part is very similar. Yeah, Dremel would be cool, but so my desire is to publish something that someone can literally just click and order and pay a minimal amount with a credit card. Uh, so I priced out on JLC PCB and I, I don't know if this will make it through their quoting process and whether the price will hold or whether they're going to bump up the price. But I think it was something like $14 to have a thousand of these made. And that sounds a whole lot more fun paying them $14 than spending a whole lot of time with a Dremel tool. That's just me. So that's that's my intent here is to try and find existing economies of scale that do pretty much what we want and then tap into them and hopefully get something that has adequate precision uh, in the correct material and is also super easy to just order more um, and also to refine because I bet my measurements are not going to be spot on. And when I take one of these up to... Uh, the Connections Museum in about 10 days. I'm actually going to Seattle and I'm going to the museum with a bunch of my nerd friends. Um, riding on the train feels a little bit ill-advised right now with Delta uh, coronavirus, but I think we're going to stick with it anyway. Um, I mean, on the train, we'd all be wearing masks, which is good and probably good enough. And we're all vaccinated, et cetera, et cetera. So it'll be fine, right? Fine. I'm not stressed at all. Nope. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I'm just going to keep noodling around here. Now, one more thing that is possible to do is to drop drills. Uh, Peter, you may recall, we talked about this a couple of nights ago. Um, did I leave those drills in? No, I think I may have, might have deleted them because I'm clever. Um, yeah. So in corners let me get some of these other layers out of the way because it's getting confusing in corners where we might want to remove that fillet because it's important to have a flat surface so that the contacts um, are aligned correctly and not pushed too far to the left because of the fillet or worse yet maybe twisted and damaged you can drill a small hole right here and basically just create sort of a three quarters opening here um, and dr drill out that fillet and, and make it make it disappear, uh, even if your routing precision is fairly coarse like this. So let me... Um, KiCad's a little funny about drills. You can't just go and draw a drill right, um, you know, anywhere you want without it being associated with a, a footprint. Um, so I've got to go and... What do I call it? Hole. Where's my other holes? Er Oh, I'm on a different computer, right? Don't have my, my usual library. Well, we'll go with a small hole. 
is we can just drop it down and it's got a whole bunch of fancy stuff on it. We don't need reference designators and silk screen and all that kind of stuff. So what I'm going to do is edit the thing in place, update, um, edit footprint. I think this does it locally. Yeah. Edit footprint just allows me to edit the footprint only in the context of the circuit board. I'm not actually editing the underlying library so that every time in the future when I'm designing a completely different board, um, I will wind up with all these changes appearing. That would suck. So I'm going to delete this stuff. I guess I can't delete that. Yeah. Makes sense. I think maybe. Um, and also I don't want mask or copper or anything like that. Um, I just want a hole. So yeah, error pad has no layer off. Okay, fine. That's fine. That's exactly what I want. Uh, except I want it to be say 0 0.6 millimeters. I know, I know. And I really hope this isn't saving to the library. It, it wouldn't allow me to. Yeah, I think I would wind up trying to write, write to like user local or user share or something like that. And it would disallow. Okay. And now I need to hide the reference designators because that's going to get messy. So properties, I haven't key catted in a while. So this is, <laughs> I've kind of forgotten some stuff as horrifying as it is to, uh, to think. Um, uh oh, suddenly I'm having a brain fart. Okay, footprint, properties. Oh, okay, yeah, that's what I was looking for. Uh, I do not want to show the reference designator or the value. Poof. Okay, so now you can move this guy where I want it. Come on, there we go. So yeah, we can now drill that, fill it out. And we've compromised a little bit on the size of the mating surface with the relay, but at least now we don't have something that's actually protruding out the fillet, um, which might cause alignment issues. <laughs> um, catching up with chat. Yeah, as in, you're probably going, ah, because you use KiCad several times a week and it's been months since I've really done any real proper layout in KiCad, sadly. Yep. Uh, you know, I added, I think, uh, one of the, one of the Twitch tags, I think I added back seating allowed or something like that. I don't, I don't have a good sense for all the Twitch topics yet. So I just added a bunch and then quickly realized that may get me a whole bunch of people watching that I don't want watching. So I, I think I removed most of them. So I think we're just IRL and science and technology topic and yeah, I don't know. I, I still don't get Twitch all that much. I should probably just spend more time looking at all the stuff that's out there instead of just watching your stream and Sylvain's stream. And I think that's about it. Anyhow, okay. So yeah, that's basically the plan for now. Um, now, I, I did talk up this project in the local hackerspace Slack group. Um, I also talked about it in the One Bit Square Discord. And there were a bunch of other ideas for ways to approach this. And they're very good ideas. They just don't have the economy of scale that I'm hoping we can get with a printed circuit board technique. So I'm filing all those away as sort of my plan B, my plan C, my plan D. If this doesn't work out acceptably, um, then I'm totally going to do these other things. So, yeah. Um, well, Peter, I still feel weird just sitting here. Click, 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 click. You're much better at chatting than I am. If you're in Shenzhen, oh, we should probably get a die cut. Yeah, that would be sweet. Uh, I've been watching this uh, YouTube cooking channel. Um, it's, I think, Chinese cooking demystified. And I think the people who do it are in Shenzhen. So <laughs> that's, uh, I don't know. I just, I watch that and I think, I want to go to Shenzhen sometime. Um, well, maybe next year would be viable. We, we were planning on doing that, weren't we? Uh, we probably would have done that two years ago. Well, no, we were talking about it two years ago. We probably would have gotten around to doing it last year, but obviously that didn't work out. Copy paste is a wonderful thing. Who invented copy and paste anyway? 
Was that part of the Doug Engelbart mother of all demos thing, or was that something else? I imagine it was a bunch of people who just sort of contributed little aspects of what we now call cut and paste. Oh, you're supposed to go in April 2020. Yeah. Did you have tickets and plans and everything in place at that point that you had to cancel? Oof. Yeah, that, that would have sucked because it probably would have been very expensive to cancel all that. Do, do, do. Hey, Russ. Uh, oh, you got a boogie. Okay, well, he's not here. I can't taunt him about uh, not... He wants to stream, too. He's got this teletype thing he's been doing that I would very much like to see happen. But all he does is he posts little videos on... Twitch and that's or not Twitch on Twitter, which isn't entirely satisfying. Um, because I don't know, it'd be fun to actually ask questions and have some dialogue about it. The, the exact things that I'm saying, oh, no one's gonna want to do that on my stream. So yeah, I am chastened. Click, click, click. How loud is my keyboard on... I can hear it in my headphones, certainly. I've got one of those WASD things, which is pretty nice as a keyboard goes, but I'm sure Peter will have opinions. Ah, I always love it when I'm really close to the correct alignment moving around some object in KiCad, and then it goes and snaps it. I should just turn snapping off because I got eyes good enough for this still. I can, yeah, you're close enough that shift doesn't override. It just winds up causing, forcing the object to vertical or horizontal. Yeah, this is going to make me crazy. I just move that out of the way, move that where I want it, and back. And problem solved in a really lame way. And this is not at a vertical, yep, there we go. EM pinball content? Wait, EM? What is that? EM pinballs. Oh, electromechanical. Okay. I mean, isn't that all pinball machines? I guess maybe the newer ones don't do that anymore, which would be a shame because that's what's so magical about them. Um, Peter, you do know there are several nerds up here in the dork bot my basically my my nerd clan that do pinball uh, and arcade machine repair and collecting to some extent uh elijah in particular um is notorious for his pinball opinions and you know as far as i know he's right i still haven't really gotten into pinball i certainly i like i love the the mechanical elements the physicality of it but as far as actually playing it, I'd much rather play a, uh, an arcade, like a video game. Just, just that's that's what I got nostalgia for. Oh, he does SNES too. I mean, why not? <laughs> why limit yourself? Oh, that copied straight. I don't know why KiCad sometimes aligns everything cleanly and sometimes doesn't. That doesn't belong there. Boom. Okay. Move. Drag. Drop. Oh, I see what's going on. Okay. So this is going faster than I expected. Um, don't be so OCD. It's fine. You don't have to line all this up perfectly. The cuts will be in the right place, even if they don't end in the perfect place. Well, well, oh, okay. So, oh, EM pinballs, you're going back to like the 60s before microprocessors started turn, turning up in them. Yeah, uh, I don't know if... Elijah's got many of those. The, there is the local uh, pinball outreach project. I don't know if they've survived. Um, I think they were actually kind of on their last legs uh, even before the pandemic. 
but um, they had a bunch of electromechanical stuff and that was amazing to see. Um, they're also, the last time I went up to the Connections Museum in Seattle, there was uh, a pinball museum up there that was pretty amazing. And one of the things we learned when we were up there, uh, we were playing some pinball machines from the late 70s, like, I don't know, 78, 79, somewhere around there. And we heard some very familiar sounds uh, and recognized them as being sounds from Defender and Joust and Robotron. And so we quickly puzzled out that, yes, they created the soundboard for those pinball machines, and then they got carried over into the Williams video games machines of the early 80s. Some of them, at least Defender, Joust, Robotron, those all, all three of them shared basically the same soundboard. And then I think Sinistar upgraded it with some sort of um, sampled speech playback. Um, yeah, they did a bunch of cool stuff with that. And that's one of the first like examples of software synthesis I can think of that on a little 8-bit computer. Um, the way that the soundboards work for Robotron and Defender and Joust and these pinball machines is it's got a 6800 processor that just sits there in a tight loop and literally just stuffs values into a DAC that then goes out through a speaker. Um, so it's literally directly synthesizing sound. Um, I th the complicating thing is I think it was doing it in a variable sampling rate kind of way. So um, the cycle counts uh, for the microprocessor and how long it took to execute each instruction was very important uh, because we learned that when we were doing the Church of Robotron, um, when we did, um, what was it, 2019 teardown? when we rolled up the uh, trailer with the Church of Robotron on it, we had set up this FPGA emulation of the video game that was using uh, a 6809 core and a 6800 core to simulate the sound, and it didn't sound right. All of us were very familiar with Robotron, having spent hundreds of hours playing the video game, and we knew exactly how it should have sounded. But um, this particular, you know, this core, it didn't sound right. And I quickly traced it down to a couple of instructions that were executing in one cycle too, li too little. And that made a difference in the pitch. The pitch was too high because the instructions were completing earlier and the period of the waveforms that, they were, that it was generating were shorter and therefore the pitch was higher. So by finding, I, I think all I did is I just went into the core and I padded out these instructions. I added an extra cycle to it. It doesn't actually do anything, um, which may not be completely accurate as far as how the 6800 worked, but for my purposes, it cleaned up the sound and it sounds just like the, the original game. Uh, well, the, the, the 6800 core was not cycle accurate. You know, the, this instruction was supposed to take four cycles and it was taking three as an example. I don't remember exactly. It is, however, in a commit in the repo on GitHub. So if you find the Robotron-FPGA repo, which I think is under jboon, not under sharebrained, uh, you may find a commit in June 2019 that should be pretty much just that, that fix. So if you want to see what I did, <laughs> it's, a, it's a bit of a butcher job. Um, we just needed to get the thing working and sounding right because we couldn't bear to let it not sound right. You know, sticklers that we are. Uh, where am I going? Wrong buttons. No, oops, I, I've almost done this, or I've almost finished. Um, yeah, okay, so the way I'm envisioning fabricating this is by doing v-score along this line and this line, which will get us that shape. Um, these are all collinear all of these edges, as far as I can tell. I mean, the part is so small that I was having trouble measuring accurately. Excuse me. So I figure since these are not, these don't strike, these, these surfaces don't strike anything. They don't push on anything. They don't, their dimensions don't seem to be critical. So I figured they'd be a good candidate for V scoring. And then all of these vertical bits, especially this edge or this, line of edges here, this line of edges here, and then all of the right edges of these notches are all critical, as is this notch, which is where the, the metal, the deflecting metal wire um, 
sort of seats into when this particular relay is supposed to be actuated. Um, if it's not supposed to be actuated, it winds up resting down here, kind of in between the two relay pairs. Um, so I don't think this edge is all that critical. It just needs to be kind of slanty. So yeah, um, hopefully this will work out really well. <laughs> uh, we'll see. But I'm going to order some from JLC PCB and then some from PCB Way, and maybe I'll even throw Osh Park into the mix just for fun and learn about how they route stuff when you ask them to route stuff really finely. Oh, Robotron played with SNES. That, uh, that's interesting. I, I'm morally opposed to it, but you know, that's because I don't, <laughs> I never came to like, uh, or even get comfortable with the uh, Nintendo controllers. That was just a bit past when I kind of stopped caring about playing computer games or video games, partly because my family didn't have the money to buy a video game machine. So uh, they did buy me a computer because they saw a lot more value in that. Uh, so I definitely found the cash for that. But uh, yeah, no video game consoles. But I do have them now, and uh, I, I, will, I will somehow learn to love the NES controller someday. Yeah, the Robotron joysticks are specific, but you can easily order them from Suzo Hap. I've got, I've got a pair, and then you know Church of Robotron's got a pair or a couple of pairs of joysticks. Um, I need to build mine into a nice, solid enclosure so that I can actually play the game as it was meant to be played. Um, I don't know. You should try, you should try the ones I've got because they are actual arcade replacements, and I think the intent is to basically sub into an existing machine without being too different. Uh, but, you know, if, if they're too clicky, um, since they do use just standard micro switches, you know, the little sort of rectangular guys about this big with the little nubbin sticking out the top, um, I think you can get those in different um, activation forces, you know, however many newtons or whatever. Uh, so it's possible you could just source a few different kinds and swap them out and find the combo that you like. I have found that like the the original machine playing in the diagonals was always very difficult, and I think that may have a lot to do with um, the design of the joysticks. And I feel like the modern ones are actually better in that regard, which, while it may not be accurate to the way the original game was, uh, is welcome because playing on the horizontal, playing with, you know, being able to shoot horizontally and move horizontally is critical for the game. And some of the old machines that I've played, it's kind of hard to get that diagonal. But yeah, I'm going off on Robotron. Um, yeah, so I'm kind of inclined to just end this right now because I think there's really not much new I can add to this other than just, you know, finish up a couple more edges, generate Gerbers, and then take them over to my other computer and order order boards and see what happens. So I guess uh, I will wrap it up here. Um, I hope this was informative. Uh, I love these, uh, these old telephone relay or these telephone switches. They're amazing to see in person, and I'm hoping that I can be a small part of making them uh, live on hopefully for another 90 years. Um, that would make me kind of happy. So um, fingers crossed this will work out. Anyway, um, it's night here, so I will say good night, but uh, you may very well be just waking up. Have a good day, and uh, see you in the next stream.